Well, I am so excited. I'm just delighted that uh, you've had me back, and I see many familiar faces here, and that is wonderful. Uh, love just kind of having a little intro question just to get us going. So once again, if you would tell me your first name, what area of forum communications you work in, and uh, just share with me one thing that you're looking forward to over the summer months, all right? Something that you're looking forward to over the summer months. And so we'll start in back, actually. I'm Chris, I work in accounting. Accounting, yes. One thing I'm looking forward to is some fishing. Fishing. Do you, uh, you have a favorite spot you like going? Just Minnesota, any Minnesota lake. Any Minnesota lake. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. You've been fishing since you were small? small? Yeah, I just grew up with it. That's great. Thank you. And then I'm in the county. Yes, that's right. We're camping. Camping. In Maplewood Park. Oh, in Maplewood. So uh, camper, tent, how, how rustic? We like tents. Wow. Yeah. Way to go. <laughs> I like hotels. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go right here. Mary in the county. Yes. Do you like to garden, Mary? Flowers all. Now, you know what, Mary, you've come all three times that I've been here. That's like unbelievable. John, I think, like, you got to give, yes, I think we should. <laughs> and John has too. And John has, <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Mary. I'm Brianne. I work on the audience engagement team, and yes. I would say going to Red Hawk Skates. Very fun. Very, very fun. Thank you. I'm looking forward to I have a trip coming up going to Montana. Glacier nice. Park, you know. I'm excited about that. Not excited for the drive. Excited to be there. Yeah. Is that your first time at Glacier? Yeah. And I, I'm definitely afraid of grizzly bears, so I've heard of <laughs> um, it. Are you going to be doing reporting from the woods looking no, for grizzlies? No? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're unplugging. Way to go. Well, I'm envious. Uh, my dad. Uh, was a huge fan of Glacier. He died when I was young. I've always wanted to go there, and I haven't made it yet. So that's still on my list of places. Please do. I would love to know that. All right, let's go here. Uh, I'm Emily. I work in the printing department over in West Fargo. Oh, nice. And I'm looking forward to swimming and lots of long walks in the nice weather. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, thank you for what you do at the printing shop. We've, we've worked with you, uh, your, you folks before, and it's been great. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm Brandy, and I'm from the printing division of West Fargo, too. Okay, great. Um, oh, I feel there's so many things I'm looking forward to. Probably just being able to be outside and all that comes with summer. Yeah, <laughs> the bugs and everything. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you. I'm Ashley, and I'm from the printing division, too. And Very nice. I would say going to the lake and gardening. Going to the lake. So do the three of you, you work out of this location, or are you work in uh, West Fargo? We all live in West Fargo. Wow. I stand these donuts. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so, like, you came over for this, and yeah. wow, that is unbelievable. <laughs> I, I think we got to bring like some prize over to that office. I don't. I, I will try my best to remember and do that. So. I'm Bob. This is Bob. Part time rep in the newsroom. Yeah. And, uh, our big thing is our son and his family from Washington State are driving out. They got six kids, six six grandkids. Going to descend on us. So nice. Six, six kids ages 15 to 6 in our house. Wow. We're looking forward to that. That's going to be fantastic. When do they come? July. In July. Yep. That's pretty cool, Bob. Yep. Thank yeah. you. I'm Chris. I work in the advertising area. Okay. And we're looking forward to spending time with the Yeah. Which, which lake you like to go um, to? My folks have a place on Maple Lake. Oh, on Maple Lake. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Chris. I'm Ryan. I work in the Yeah. yeah. Did you have any luck this weekend? You said you're out. We didn't or, actually fish. We oh, you didn't fish. Boating. Just went boating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brian just told me his daughter is going to be at boot camp this summer, so that's going to be a whole experience. Uh, we went through that a couple summers ago with our son, and that that impacts your summer and just mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. Apologize for being anti-social. <laughs> I just want to be comfortable. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And you match the gray. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, I work in the county, and uh, I would just like things to slow down a little bit. 
it's, it's like, it's like, <laughs> so you do see, you see it slowing down a tish? Not yet. <laughs> you're hoping, you're hopeful. All right, well thanks all for uh, your input. Fun, uh, my name's John, I guess. Uh, as far as the summer, uh, you know we've got a couple cool trips. Uh, I'll just say this one, we're gonna go down to Salt Lake City. Uh, my mom had two sisters, three girls in their family. They're very, very close. Uh, my mom passed last June. My other aunt passed away last fall. So my, my aunt, uh, this will be her first birthday with both of her sisters not here with her. And so we are, uh, we, we, she knows, but we surprised her by telling her we're going to come and celebrate. I've never celebrated her birthday with her. I just know that it's, uh, those girls were just as close as any three people I've ever seen in my life. In fact, they all used to say, we want to be the first to go because we can't imagine living without our sisters. And so she is actually the last uh, to go. And so we decided to, to celebrate her birthday with her. So we're excited to go to Salt Lake and uh, do that the weekend before the 4th of July. So um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm old. Uh, the people who invested in me and uh, modeled what it means to uh, what it means to have character, what it means to invest in people. Those who've invested in me when I was young, I have a, hopefully a greater love and respect, and I will do whatever I can to help them finish really well. For me, that's just become very, very important. And uh, honestly, now since my mom passed, I ask myself all the time, what would my mom want me to do? I know my mom would want me to go to Salt Lake and be with her sister on her birthday because her other sisters are unable to be there. So. Um, we're talking about servant leadership. Uh, this is kind of a two-part. I know some of you weren't at part one, and, and you'll be, uh, I know you'll get a lot out of today. I just want to go over a few things that we did talk about, though, in session one. We talked about leadership being both positional as well as personal. In other words, a lot of times when we think of leadership, we think of being a boss, a supervisor, an owner. That is the positional aspect of leadership, and of, that is certainly a part of it. But leadership, at the end of the day, is much more personal. It's relationships. It's investing in people. Um, leadership is simply a means to the end, which is to help other people. Uh, the worst leader that you will find is the person that wants to be a leader. The worst mayor, governor, president is the person that wants to be a mayor, a, gov a, a governor, or a president. Uh, you actually... Uh, uh, you, uh, at the end of the day, uh, leadership is about serving others. It's about helping others uh, without anything guaranteed to come back to you in return. So those who really want to be the manager of the department, uh, I would caution them to really ask themselves, is that really what you want or is it an opportunity to invest and help more people? Uh, so leadership is both positional as well as personal. Uh, last time we talked about leadership as both task as well as relationship. And we all kind of have a tendency, some of us tend to be more task oriented, and that is great. Obviously in leadership, you gotta get things done. You gotta help the team you know, accomplish something. Um, others of us tend to be more relational, and that is a part of leadership as well. Um, it's not all task, it's not all relationship. Uh, leadership is actually a great blend of both task as well as relationship. We've all been around people that they probably get the job done, but no one really wants to run with them after that job gets done, right? <laughs> They're like, boy, if another opportunity opens up, I think I'll take it. Um, we actually want people that want, to, that want to be with us and not have to be with us. And so leadership is both task and relationship. Uh, we talked a little bit about power versus authority. And once again, power is where you have, the, uh, you have some uh, some force, if you will. That's uh, when your children are young. You can tell them, get in your room, time out. Uh, you know, once they go through boot camp, uh, it's a whole different parenting game. <laughs> you know, my son, uh, he's accomplished something that I've never done in my life. So in a way, I can't just exert, uh, he's 20 as well, uh, I can't just exert my force on him. I can't just sit him down <laughs> and say, you need to listen to me, here's what you need to do. I, I, I can't do that. Uh, so. There's power, but there's also authority. How do we connect with people? Um, one of John Maxwell's books is everybody communicates, few connect. A lot of people think communicating and connecting are the same. Uh, they're not. Uh, there's overlap. In fact, uh, last week in the forum, I think I wrote about communicating and connecting, and I used uh, 
an example of a gal named Abigail, but uh, connecting is when you are uh, putting yourself in the shoes of the other person, when you're understanding what makes them tick, what do they value, uh, what's important to them. And so we want to just talk uh, a little bit more about that. Last time I gave you an acrostic on how to connect with people. Uh, I'm actually writing a column uh, last night uh, on my uh, laptop. I was writing about how do we have chats with people. So those of you that were here, I talked about the four questions uh, that everyone is asking uh, a leader. Your spouse, your kids, your coworkers, certainly if you're a supervisor, these are the four questions that everybody is asking you. And uh, if you answer them well, then you are connecting. If you don't answer these well, there's going to be a huge disconnect. Uh, anyone remember what the C-H-A-R-T stood for? Care. Yep. Perfect. People are asking, do you really care about me? Or am I just, uh, am I just uh, an inconvenience? Are you just enduring this relationship? Am I just a sales? Am I just uh, another customer that pays the bills? Um, or do you really care about my goals, my values, my hopes, my dreams? Um, it's a huge. Uh, we're going to talk about it later today, but it's interesting. We, we judge others based on their actions, and we judge ourselves based on our intentions. You ever thought about that? Oh, no, I, I do care about Bob, but I just don't show it that often. <laughs> So I judge myself based on my intentions. Judges, or Bob is judging me on my actions. We do that all the time. I don't think Brian cares about me because I don't see that he cares. And he's saying, well, no, I, I do care. I just, maybe I don't always show it. I don't know how to show it. Um, so it's interesting. We judge ourselves for good intentions. But at the end of the day, I'm just telling you, good intentions are not going to get the job done. You're not going to have a good marriage simply because you have good intentions to be a loving husband or wife. <laughs> you actually have to do the hard work. You aren't going to be a great dad just because you have good intentions. You know, it's because as your daughter has goals and dreams, you step into action. And H stands for help. So Brian was telling me, what, for five years, your daughter has had this, this goal of uh, going into the Guard and being an Army Guard member. And I'm guessing she has a, an, an AAT that has been interesting to her. And what, what is that? She wants to go medical, absolutely. I know a gal that was in the Guard for 20-some years, medical, and she's a, a leader in the medical field here in our city now. Um, so the question is, you know that your child has a goal of, of doing that. Do we, do we help? Did we do something? To, did we say, hey, I know someone that has done this. Why don't we go visit? Well, let's take this gal out for lunch, and we can get her experiences. Uh, you said she's going to be down in what, South Carolina, right? So, yeah, are you going to write her? Are you going to encourage her? Do you have other family members that you're going to get? It, it's a big deal. It's a hard, what, 10, I forget how many exact weeks. Ten, is it 10 weeks? Yeah. So, help, once again. It's great to say, well, I've always had intentions of, of helping my coworker. Well, congratulations for having good intentions. When's the last time you've helped your coworker? When's the last time they're struggling with daycare and you said, you know what? Let me, I'll watch your kids so that you and your husband can go out on a date. I know you're going through a hard time now. Um, so help. Uh, a, anyone remember what A stood for? Admit. That's right. Those that follow us don't expect us to be perfect. They do wonder, are we ever going to admit when we make a mistake? <laughs> People don't expect us to be perfect, but when it's clear that you said something inappropriate in a meeting, are you going to admit it? Or are you just going to shove it under the carpet? Uh, how many kids have rebelled against their families because they grew up with a mom and dad who never admitted they were wrong? They were never authentic with them. Because uh, I'm just telling you, uh, any of us that are parents, we've made mistakes. I'm just, if you don't think you made a mistake, that's your first mistake. <laughs> and. Uh, our kids don't expect us to be perfect, but they do wonder, are we ever going to look at them and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, I said this, I embarrassed you in front of your friend, whatever it was. I tried minimizing an issue that was really big for you, and now I, I'm sorry. So, care, help, admit, and then T is? Yeah. Are you someone that I can trust? 
Uh, do you do what you say you're going to do? Hello? Let me give you these two items. You're very welcome. Let me clear that spot for you. Uh, so trust. Um, do you say, do you do what you say you're going to do? Uh, obviously, honesty. Uh, I will tell you that uh, for me, uh, honesty is just like a baseline characteristic that we all should have. But, uh, you know, those who will call in to, to work saying that they're sick and they're not really sick, uh, trust, trust has a ripple effect. Uh, when your kids see you being dishonest um, with your boss, they also are convinced you're probably dishonest with them at times. There is a ripple effect to honesty. <laughs> we think that I just build trust with Bob one-on-one. -on -one. Was it Chris? Yeah. yeah. So you know what? Either I have a trusting relationship with Bob, and that doesn't affect my relationship with Chris. Can I just tell you that's baloney, all right? Chris is watching how honest am I with Bob, and vice versa. So there is a ripple effect to honesty that uh, those who are dishonest in their home, I don't, obvious, whatever it is, our kids that hear us lying on the phone to a family member, you know, they now have less trust with us when we are talking to them. Does that make sense? <laughs> there is a ripple effect. Um, trust isn't just a one-on-one -on -one exchange. You're actually exchanging trust with everyone in your life every day, all the time. Does that make sense? So a uh, few things about trust is uh, some people think trust is kind of a soft, um, kind of a, a, a soft a quality or characteristic. Uh, the reality is that trust is hard, real, and it's very quantifiable. It affects speed as well as cost in every organization. Uh, we are paying a huge cost in America, I am convinced, in almost every sector, including uh, churches, schools, for-profit, not-for-profit, government. We are paying a huge monetary price for a lack of trust builders throughout our society right now. Um, trust, the myth is trust is built solely on integrity. Uh, that's not true. Trust is actually a function of both character as well as competence. Um, <laughs> there, are, uh, there are things that you would not, you should not trust me to fix your vehicle. All right, I'm just telling you, I'm incompetent <laughs> at fixing your vehicle. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't have character. It means I'm not competent. And so uh, trust is also a function of competence. Uh, do you ever admit that you're not good at something in your job and you enlist someone else to help you? Or do you think that you, oh, I got to do this all, I, I got to hide my weaknesses? Uh, when you try hiding your weaknesses, that is an absolute almost guarantee that you're going to destroy trust around the people. Uh, it's actually a very uh, uh, affirming thing to say, you know what, I'm good at this, I'm good at this, I'm not good at this, I know that you are good at this, can you, can you give me some tips or would you be willing to take this part and we can work together? And um, So... Uh, some people think that you can't teach trust. Uh, that's not true. Uh, we can. Uh, the number one way that we can be taught trust is by getting uh, feedback from the people in our life. Uh, once again, if you have a spouse or kids, ask them how trustworthy you are. <laughs> They'll tell you. if They, if the, they, they have to at least trust you enough that uh, you aren't going to uh, uh, rebel against what they say. Uh, so that's actually step number one. If you aren't even trusting enough, they won't even tell you the truth because they don't trust that you're... First of all, they may not trust that you're not going to use it against them or you're not going to get angry and upset with them. Number two, they may not trust that you're going to do anything about it. Because why would I reveal something kind of vulnerable if I don't think you're going to do anything with it, right? So uh, ask the people around you. Uh, uh, they'll give you some good feedback, and you can actually learn to be a more trustworthy person if it's something that you choose to do. So just a little bit about chat. Does this make some sense? Every day I'm telling you, your coworkers, your boss, if you're a supervisor, the people that report to you, they are asking, does he or she really care about me? Is he or she willing to help me? If they see that I have a need, or do I have to go to them, or do they already see, hey, I see that you're struggling with this. Uh, I came up with something that I think will help you. Um, 
do I admit my mistakes? Am I vulnerable enough, authentic enough? And then am I someone who uh, is trustworthy? All right, so I want to go into then, um, and we are going to wrap up at 10 to 1. So I'd love to hear now from you. Uh, so we're talking about servant leadership. Uh, who are some examples? Uh, you don't have to, I guess if you've worked at the forum for a long time, you can, you can share that example. But it, it can be outside, obviously, of work. Who, who's someone that you would say uh, you've learned or you've, model, you've seen servant leadership in? Yeah. yeah. She Tell does us. a lot of stuff after movies, and she does a lot of things with like women and like media and just in Hollywood and stuff. I think she's really inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else have an example? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Your dad. Tell us. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, Brian. Someone else have an example? I kind of think of two of my college instructors yeah. who really invested in students like personally and wanted to see them thrive in their career afterwards and also just wanted to not hang out with them outside of class, but invest in who they are outside of their college career as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. What an opportunity. Actually, when you said uh, uh, the person, Gina Davis, I was thinking about uh, Matt Cullen here in town, who uh, I think without a ton of fanfare, he does a, uh, he comes back, I think every summer, and he does a hockey clinic for kids that otherwise would never be able to attend one. And uh, I happened to hear about it last summer, kind of through the grapevine, uh, through someone who helped with it. Uh, maybe I'm just missing it on the news, but I hadn't heard a ton about it. And uh, come to find out, he does this somewhat under the radar, um, which I was like, wow, that's just pretty cool. You know, that a guy who won the Stanley Cup last year, if you're a hockey person, uh, the Penguins last year, and they're in the Stanley Cup again this year, but a guy coming off winning the, the biggest prize of them all in the hockey world comes back to his hometown and does a, a hockey camp for kids that uh, otherwise couldn't afford going to something like that. So, um, he also has a foundation. It, I say he does, yeah, exactly, yeah. All those, all those things for kids, that's right, yeah. So I'll just tell you real quick, uh, parent is who came to my mind. Uh, my dad died when I was uh, 18 months old, unexpectedly. Uh, he was healthy as I am in, on a Wednesday, and he passed away on Sunday. Um, so my mom uh, had a 18-month-old and a three-year-old as a single mom. Um, I think the thing, one thing that sticks out in my brain, there's so many examples I could give you, but uh, we moved back to her hometown was Williston, North Dakota, and so that's how I grew up in Williston. My mom moved back to her hometown. Uh, we lived in a very small apartment. Um, I suppose, I don't know, probably this room, <laughs> honestly. But we grew up in a two-bedroom apartment, and my mom uh, believed that it was important for both of her kids to have their own bedroom. And so my mom slept on the couch for uh, seven years. Uh, it was also, uh, sometimes she would pull it out, sometimes she would just sleep on the couch. Uh, when I was uh, third grade, uh, she ended up losing feeling in her legs and uh, was in the hospital for about a month trying to figure out what had gone on. We still don't know exactly what happened, but there is some thought that perhaps it was because she slept on a couch for seven years. Uh, and then the stress of losing her husband and trying to keep a family together as a single mom. Um, so I could go on and on. I didn't realize uh, uh, going into, I'll come back to my mom in a sec as we talk about valuing people, but uh, my mom ended up uh, going back to school uh, as a single mom uh, with, uh, I was in the second grade, my sister was in fourth grade. Uh, she went back to night school, summer school. Uh, she took more summer credits than anyone in the history of the University of Mary. Uh, she literally probably slept two hours a night, they let her take like 25 credits over the summer. Because <laughs> she said, I'm a single mom, I got to get her done. 
Uh, she shipped my sister and I off to some family members in Iowa, and she nailed it. And uh, ended up going into public education, ended up becoming a principal. She won uh, the Bell Ringer Award for, uh, I think, two or three principals every year, win it in the state of North Dakota. And uh, super proud of her. She modeled servant leadership. I watched as she sacrificed for her teachers, as she wrote notes to them. Uh, she was always, always encouraging them. She, my mom felt like the biggest need in public education is encouragement. And she said, John, we have teachers. They can get the job done. We don't have a ton of competent, incompetent teachers. We have a lot of discouraged teachers. Uh, low pay, all they hear are the problems from every parent. Um, many parents that don't send the emails of positive, they just email when, oh, this went wrong, this went wrong. And so my mom said, my number one job is to go into uh, my school and to help boost the morale and to bring energy to my teachers. And uh, she actually worked uh, in a small town outside of Williston that honestly has a lot of, just a lot of challenges, honestly, a lot of uh, alcohol problems, a lot of high divorce and, and uh, uh, crime. And uh, she felt like that was her spot that she needed to go and to encourage students and to encourage teachers. Um, so she was a great example for me of servant leadership. So I wanna just walk through real quick. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was thinking about my uncle who was a pastor uh, this morning when I was thinking about this. And uh, my uncle was in Iowa. And uh, yeah, you know what? Obviously, church is going to have difficult times financially. And he literally, uh, in Iowa, I don't know, I think it's like three or four or five cents a can that you pay uh, for aluminum cans, and you can turn them back in for five cents now. Um, whereas in North Dakota, I mean, how many aluminum cans does it take to get a pound? I mean, it's like a great, it's a lot, right? <laughs> but in Iowa, you can get five cents for every aluminum can that you turn in. Uh, my uncle had a several month period where that's the only way they had food to eat was he, he had parks in his neighborhood and he would walk and get as many aluminum cans as he could and turn that in uh, because he was receiving no salary from the church um, because it was a small church. It was what God called him to do, to serve. And uh, he felt like that's what he needed to do to, to impact his community. So yeah, I was thinking about him this morning as I was uh, working on this. Um, so in the 21 Laws of Leadership, uh, law number five, uh, John Maxwell says, leaders add value by serving others. Powerful sentence. It's not how far we advance ourselves, but how far we advance others. <laughs> At the end of the day, leadership isn't about how far we advance. It's how far do we advance others. Um, so a few things about adding value to people. We all add value to things that we see as valuable. Um, I'm guessing all of us have probably bought like our first, our first car. Um, Chris, you remember your very first car that you ever purchased? Mm -hmm. You remember, what was it? It was a 66 Mustang. 66 Mustang. And how did you treat it? Like it was my baby. Absolutely. We've all had that first car, right? And we treat it like, I mean, I remember my first vehicle. I painted the rims, took me forever. I remember I had this little notebook in the glove box. I would write down the mileage and how many gallons. And I, I'm a math nerd, so I would calculate how many miles per gallon. I had this little notebook, and I kept it as clean as I could. Um, why did we do those things? Because it was valuable to us, right? And so. The things that are valuable to us, we add more value. What are some things you did to your Mustang, for your Mustang? Well, the way I got it, there was no radio, no stereo. Okay. Um, so, and the back seat needed to be redone. So, you know, that's where I started, doing a stereo. And yep. Back yep. So, the things that are valuable to us, we add value to. If you're a homeowner versus renting. Uh, I'm guessing most of you, if you've rented or are renting, you haven't painted too many walls or moved any walls <laughs> or uh, added new carpet. But when you own a home, you do those sorts of things. Maybe you do some landscaping. Maybe you, you know, remodel your kitchen. We add value to the things that are valuable. So obviously, my question with that is how valuable are people to you? 
If they aren't important to you, then you won't add value to them. But if people really matter to you, you will add value to them. <laughs> you will do things to show that you care. You'll help. You'll admit your mistakes because relationships and people really matter. You'll work harder at being a trustworthy person. Um, the, next, the next statement is we always invest by intention, not by accident. Uh, it wasn't on accident that you put a new radio in your Mustang. You didn't just wake up one day like, oh, I didn't know I had a radio in here. <laughs> in fact, how long? You, uh, tell us a little bit. You probably, did you shop for one? You... See, what, I can't remember what the magazine was back yeah. in the day, but you yeah, had to order it from a magazine. Absolutely. Yeah. Crutchfield. Yeah. Yeah, so that wasn't an accident, right? You intentionally, you bought the magazine, or you were interested in the magazine, you researched, you read, you wrote a check, you know, or you, you got an envelope and a stamp. I mean, there's a ton of things that you did in, in order to get that radio in that car, right? And so the same is true. I'm just telling you, you aren't going to just accidentally add value to people. One of the questions... Uh, the reason we had to reschedule is my father-in-law passed away unexpectedly uh, about a month ago. Uh, it's been tough. It's been difficult. Um, they have two... Uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law did foster care. Uh, they, they had five older children, and as soon as the oldest one was 19, <laughs> they started doing foster care. And there was a sibling group of three that they were willing to take on as foster children, their goal was not to, quote, adopt them, but it's very difficult to find a family that will adopt three children. And so they lived with them for two years, and everyone was willing to adopt one or two of them, and they wanted to split the kids up, and they felt like, no, we shouldn't do that. So their act of, of service is they, ended, they adopted those three children. So my mother-in-law now is a single mom with two sophomores in high school. Uh, very challenging. But... Uh, actually, the day, I think it was the day before I was going to come here, uh, we got a call. At, my father-in-law had been sick. We thought he was getting better, but all of a sudden we got a call that basically said his heart rate is going down. Uh, you need to get to Bismarck if you want to uh, see him. And so we got there literally the last 10 minutes of his life. And uh, we sat, there were about 11 of us in the uh, hospital uh, in the hospital room as he uh, passed very peacefully. But the question that's been going through my brain that I will throw out to you, who are the five or six or seven or eight people that you want around your hospital bed or your couch, wherever you breathe your last? Who are those eight people, those five people that you hope are in that room? And then I would ask, are you intentionally investing in those relationships? You know, if you want your son to be there, well, uh, are you investing in that relationship with your son? You want your brother or your sister to be there. How's that relationship going, right? Um, the fact of the matter is we always invest intentionally, not accidentally, all right? Uh, make yourself more valuable. No one relate to what others value. Uh, the story I was going to share about my mom is uh, I thought my mom liked sports because we grew up watching uh, the Dallas Cowboys together. Uh, we watched NDSU Bison football together. Uh, about five years ago, she said, you know what, John? When you were a little kid, I saw how interested you were in sports, and I realized that if I wanted to have a relationship with you, a good relationship with you, I needed to become interested in sports. She said, I chose to start following the Dallas Cowboys, the NDSU Bison football team, because I knew that was something you were interested in. Uh, that blew me out of the water. I had no idea. <laughs> I'm like, really? She said, yeah. I knew that I needed to connect with the things you're interested in, not just the things I'm interested in. Uh, those are some of my best memories. In fact, this fall, that's what I'm going to grieve again, is I'm not watching Bison football with my mom anymore. Um, but if you want to value people, you have to listen. You have to learn what they're interested in, and you have to connect with them around what they value, not simply what you value. Okay, And I think I, I shared it. We judge ourselves based on our intentions, but we judge others based on their actions. And so my two, my two challenges to you are, if you think of something good to say, say it. Just practice this for one week. 
just for this next week. If something good pops in your brain, you're like, hey, man, those are really sweet shoes. Say it. Um, man, I'm so thankful that, uh, you know, uh, Matt, I didn't have this dry erase board, and Matt was willing to bring one down from wherever he is in this building. So, you know what? I need to email Matt when I get back to my office and say, hey, thanks for bringing that dry erase board, because I knew I was going to use it. So, for one week even, if you think of something good to say, say it. So don't judge yourself based on good intentions. Actually judge yourself, if you will, based on saying it. And of course, the same is true. If you think of something good to do, do it. You know that your grandson loves Toy Story, and you see something. Man, my grandson would really love that toy. Buy it. Give it to him. <laughs> If you think of something good to say, say it. If you think something good to do, do it. And I'm telling you, it will revolutionize the relationships in your life. Uh, so often those things come to our mind. Um, you know that your wife likes Diet Coke on your way home from work today. Stop at Casey's and buy her a Diet Coke. Bring it home with you. You'll be amazed at when you do the things that pop in your brain and you say the things, the good things that pop in your mind, you'll be amazed at, uh, at the power of connection. So that is that, and we have about eight minutes. Here's what I'm going to do. I want you to take out these cards that I gave you. These are characteristics of a servant leader. Uh, I want you to label them one through eight, one being the most important, meaning, uh, and let's just actually, let's just focus on our workplace. Which one of these for you would be the most important as a characteristic of the environment uh, for your work. And then which one would be number eight? And you label them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And just put that number on the back of the card, okay? So they can't all be ones? They cannot all be ones, no. <laughs> Just for time's sake, if you're having a difficult time as a minimum, actually, you know what? No, I want you to do all eight because we're going we're gonna to do something here, quick here with them. So I'm just going to give you about 20 more seconds, so you just have to, you just have to go for it. <laughs> No right or wrong answer. That's what's great about it. That's what makes it harder. <laughs> it depends on the day, I think. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But now what I want you to do uh, for sure is the one that you marked number one. I want you to think of a time when that characteristic was absent from an environment, a relationship, okay? Could be a sports team you were a part of. Could be a work situation. Not currently, <laughs> but I want you to think of a time, uh, and if you can't think of a time where that was absent, then I want you to think of a time where it was, it was, it was there, and because I want you to just take yourself to, um, what did you have as number one? Kindness. Kindness. So I want you to think of a time in your life where kindness was absent, a situation, uh, or if you can't, think of a time where kindness was clearly present. So I want us to just think for a minute and describe a little bit to each other what was that like when that characteristic was missing? And what was it like when that characteristic was present? Okay? So I want you to think about that maybe on the back. If you have a pen, you can even just write a, some, just a, one or two words that remind you of that situation. Like if there was a time in kindness where, you know what, it was your fifth grade class where all of it, you know, sixth grade can be tough, seventh grade, and boy, there just was not a lot of kindness, so then you would just write seventh grade history or whatever, okay? Does that make sense? So 
So just for your number one, I want you to at least kind of wrap your brain around that a little bit. I'll just give you 30 seconds and then we're going to All right, so I'm going to have all of you stand. And we're going to just do a quick little, uh, little exercise. If you'd like to keep eating, feel free to go ahead and do that. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to call out. Uh, let's see. Would you just read, just pick one of these, please. Uh, yeah, which one did you pick? Patience. Patience. Would you just read patience to us? Patience to show. So here's what I want you to do. If you put number one, if patience is your number one, I want you here. If patience is your number eight, I just kind of want you guys to line up uh, wherever we've got some room. So the ones would be here, and then two, three, four, five, six, kind of seven, if you had a little bit lower. Try and get an order of where you put patience between one and eight, okay? And so, Amy, you, where did you have it? Three. You had a three. So you had a three. Do we, do we have any ones and two? If you, uh, where did you have patience? Oh, um, she had two. Okay, so then you would be right here. So you guys, who had it as one? All right. John, where were you at? <laughs> so you had it at six and you had it. Four. You had it four. Well, so we're all pretty good. And then three was in the middle. Bob, where were you at? Okay, so then you're over. Oh, you had no. Where did you have patience, though? Where did you have patience at? We're, we're doing our patience scale right now. I didn't have the patience to do it. Oh. <laughs> so it's not important to you. You'd be. I'm only over here. Okay, so tell us real quick. Uh, patience. Did you? Is there an experience where there wasn't patience and how that felt to you? Yes and no, but I can't think of anything in particular. The okay. reason I have patience is that if you don't have patience, then it quickly spirals downward into something a not a good situation. Okay, absolutely. Uh, will you just, uh, kindness. Yep. Will you read kindness, please? Yep. To give attention, appreciation, and encouragement. So let's do the same with kindness. Ones are over here, eights are down there. Let's see where you... So these are two. Wow, you're a seven? Yeah. Okay. I felt pressure for a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Who had it? That was one. One, two, three, four. Who would like to, uh, John, how about you tell us uh, kindness? Well, I didn't have any specific, but okay. just the, the part for appreciation and encouragement, looking for those opportunities where you can get that. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's go to humility. Same thing. Ones are over here, eights are over here. Where'd you have humility at? So no one <laughs> So no ones. No twos? Any threes? Four? You had three? You had four? No other fours on humility? Wow, well there we go. We found out what's uh there's no right or wrong answer, so interesting. Uh, anyone, anyone have an example of where humility was lacking in an organization, a team, and how that felt? <laughs> anyone not wanting to share at work on lack of humility? <laughs> it just gets difficult if somebody can't take humility because you can't bring a point of fault to them or any argument, so when you have that, it just, yeah. I've been in situations where it just explodes and you can't. Anything come to the yeah, it's hard to have a relationship, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, uh, respectfulness. Uh, would someone read respectfulness? To treat others as important. People. To treat others as important. So, Amy, you must have had that one? Yep. Two. You had it as two? Two. two. Four. Okay. Three. 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 Three.
Okay, you had three, so we're all pretty high on respectfulness. Um, Mary, would you just tell us a little bit, uh, respectfulness, why, what did you have it as, one or two? One. Okay, so tell us. Was there a time where it's been lacking? Why did you, why is that so important to you? Well, you need, you need to be treated just as a human being, not just like you're yeah. you know, there to uh, do someone else's. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not just to boss people around, but work together and yeah. treat each other as. Yeah. Yeah, respect is huge, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay. We've got, let's just do one more, and then we are out of time. Let's just do, uh, let's do forgiveness. Once again, one's over here, all the way down to eight. <laughs> What's the highest we have? Five. Wow, five and below. Interesting. Anyone want to share forgiveness? Any reason why it was lower than the others? I found a lot of the other ones to be important because without the other things, yeah. it's, it's hard to do forgiveness. Yeah. You know? so. yeah. It would be inauthentic in some ways if you didn't have some of those other characteristics that we have just talked about. It's one thing to ask for forgiveness, but if you're not respectful. So that makes sense. All right, you can go ahead and sit down. Uh, I need to wrap. I do have a, uh, yes. So here's your assignment. This is a handout on these eight characteristics. And uh, in fact, let's give everybody two of them. Because here's what we're going to do is you can fill one out on yourself. And then I would encourage you, uh, give someone else permission to fill one out on their perception of you. Maybe a great conversation starter <laughs> at the supper table some night. Um, you don't have to. I'm just, I'm just giving you an opportunity. <laughs> You could actually allow someone else to uh, fill this out uh, on you. But these questions, uh, <laughs> these are some tangible questions that will uh, that evaluate these eight characteristics. The very last thing that I have uh, for you, and then we're going to close, is anyone want to take a guess where these eight characteristics come from? Anyone ever been to a wedding? Have you ever heard anything read at a wedding? Love is, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Love does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You know, at the end of the day, you may or may not like First that's from in the Bible, First Corinthians chapter 13. You may want nothing to do with the Bible, but I'll guarantee you there aren't any of us that wouldn't love more of this in our workplace. And it comes right out of First Corinthians chapter 13. So one of the best-selling leadership books of all time is called The Servant. Over 3 million copies sold, and the whole book comes out of First Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, love is patient, love is kind. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I've enjoyed my time, and uh, yeah. Pray that everything goes great uh, in your workplace and in your home. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.